Good morning. This is my first time doing the announcements, and Eric said, be sure you make everybody feel welcome. This is how welcome we are by God and by each other, and this is the real deal. Think of that time when you went somewhere and the people there made you feel so welcome you didn't even want to leave. Well, you're more welcome than that here this morning. And that's truly how, how we interact with one another and what a blessing it is to be together. Uh, if, if it's your first time and you feel like it, sign the card in front of you and either put it in in the back where the offering is, or even better, hand it to Pastor Eric. I've been asked to bring to your attention the choir practice today at 5.30. Uh, the men's fall Bible study will have our last session this Tuesday night. You can do it uh, by telephone or, or personally. We're looking at a book called Follow Him in All Things, and this will be our last um, session during this time. The Thanksgiving service will be the, the 22nd. Uh, during both the 9 and 11 o'clock services, we'll have a special Thanksgiving service. We'll have an opportunity to say to one another what we hopefully are saying every day to God. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you for breath and life and, and all the blessings. Be sure and save the date for the ladies' tea and cookie exchange at Linda Colombo's house on December the 5th uh, at 11 to 1. Are you packing today? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Well, we're going to pack right after the 11 o'clock service. You, you, you thought I meant uh, guns. No, 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 not guns, not guns. <laughs> packing for a Christmas child. <laughs> Operation Christmas Child, um, and I've got some some challenging news and some good news. The good news is that it only costs nine dollars a box to ship these overseas. The challenging news is we have all the money; we just have to get it out of our pocket and put it out. <laughs> nine dollars per. If everybody gave nine dollars, we would have that covered. That's what it costs to to send this box of joy to a child somewhere around the world that, that otherwise wasn't expecting to receive anything. What a blessing. That's the greatest investment we could ever make. How, how what a great return on a $9 investment. A congregational meeting next Sunday, there will be a discussion, uh, let's see, following both services, uh, the elders will be asking you to approve the sale of a residential lot in Covington that was donated to the church sometime in the past. And then student family gathering next Sunday, uh, November 15th at 3 o'clock at the new property. I think they'll be playing kickball and uh, other, other activities. So we had a great time up there last <laughs> Sunday, and I look forward to them enjoying that time. So thank y'all. God bless you. Have a great day. Good morning. Good morning. I do not like having to follow that. <laughs> but thank you, Hollis. Um, I am here to highlight our missionaries for the month. If you will look at your bulletin on the very back, we have the Bolins family. And how many of you have had the pleasure of knowing Jeremy and his sweet family. I know that Jeremy has um, a long history with our church. His mother Peggy is a church member. Um, he's been here before to share about his ministry. So I'm gonna ask you to take this home and pray for him, but I'm just gonna share a little bit of information about Jeremy and his wife. Um, her name is Lisa, and they have three beautiful daughters. They actually serve um, on the campus of Texas Tech. Now, being a Texas Longhorn and the Baylor Bear, I don't really <laughs> endorse the Raiders too much, but I will endorse his ministry. Um, he is with Crew, which is Campus Crusade for Christ, and they really search after students that are there on campus. And as I was looking over this information to share with you, it just really made me think that this is a great way for us to search after the lost 
that are in our sphere of influence. So um, when you open it up, you're going to see you know, a picture of Jeremy there with his guns up. He's packing. Packing as a Texas Raider. Um, and it's a picture of really how they had to minister to their students this year. You know, with our um, COVID situation, they had to kind of think outside the box. And so what they typically do is give t-shirts away on campus and they ask students to fill out a survey. Um, so they were giving away the t-shirts, but then I believe they had to do the surveys online. And just really a great story there about um, a student who's filled out the survey a couple of times. And so I'm going to ask you to really take this home. You'll see, you know, a great story here. Um, but just to kind of give you the cliff notes on that, this student has filled the survey out twice. And the first time he filled it out, when they asked him where he was in his relationship with Christ, I mean, it was like way down low. And then the second time, he had moved a little bit more, you know, in the right direction. But they just don't stop there. They go and seek out those students and pursue a relationship with them, whether it be over coffee or, you know, whatever it may be. And as you read this, you're going to see how they really presented the gospel. And this student really had to think about where he was spiritually. And, you know, when Eric and I were talking about it, I mean, they talked about eternity with with Christ and they talk about hell separation from God you know and we don't really like to get into that too much but that's a reality and so it's just a beautiful example I think we can take things from just reading this little paragraph here about how we can <clears throat> apply that to our lives not that it has to be the exact same way but really pursuing those that need to hear the gospel and so that's what Jeremy and his wife do at Texas Tech we have been supporting them for years. We have been praying for them for years. And they need, they need that support. So I'm going to ask you to pray, you know, continue to, to support the ministry budget, which is separate from the operating budget, because that money goes directly to our missionaries that support the kingdom of God all over the world. Um, this is something that Jeremy had written on... Um, he had given this quote to Eric for the missions flyer for a couple of years ago, and I just think it's beautiful. Um, he said, we reach out to law students at Texas Tech University with the message of hope and forgiveness in Christ. We to win students to Christ, build them up in their faith, and equip them to be sent out as lifetime laborers for Christ, no matter where they go after college. And I thought to myself, wow, I need to be winning people to Christ. I need to be building up people in Christ. And, you know, I'm a laborer, and I need to equip them to be laborers. So a really good challenge for all of us, and I feel really compelled to pray for them right now. Um, so let's do that. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for Jeremy and Lisa and their three children that serve on the campus of Texas Tech. Father, I want to thank you for how you have raised uh, Jeremy and his family up for a time such as this. When he was here, you know, growing up, Lord, you had a plan for his life. You had ordered his steps and you just asked him to walk where you had already established his life. And so, Lord, that's a challenge for each of us. I want to pray that for us. But, Lord, I want to thank you that Jeremy and his, and his wife, Lisa, have answered that call and they have been so faithful. Lord, we just pray that at this moment they would just feel your overwhelming love. They would sense um, that they are being lifted up in prayer. And Lord, I just pray that you would um, let them know, Lord, that you've got them during this very difficult time of ministering to students. Lord, I just pray they would draw close to you in these days. Lord, that they would come to you for everything they need. And we just pray your protection over his sweet family. And we just thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And one last thing. Take a look at that beautiful slide up there. That was 
listening to you, Hollis, give the announcements, and I thought, how beautiful is that? So I just want to thank the, the team back there that always provide beautiful slides for us to really look at God's creation. Just a beautiful picture. So thank you all so much. Y'all have a great day. Thank you, Melissa. How are you doing this morning? I want to ask you if you're packing that Ms. Hollis is on. Please stand. Our call to worship this morning is Great is the Lord. <laughs> someone is genuinely glad to see you. Uh -huh. I don't experience it often. <laughs> Barely does, so thanks again. Uh, it's a wonderful gift to be happy to see someone and it costs you nothing, so uh, let's just be happy to see someone. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Uh, or rather, read along with me. But blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we, as we study our scripture, the blessing of the scripture that you have provided to us, we see passages over and over and over again asking us, pleading with us, instructing us and commanding us to trust in you. Heavenly Father, we will be <laughs> obedient to you so that we are not anxious and we are not fearful and we will never fail to bear fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yep. You can be seated. Our worship hymn this morning is nothing but the glory. We're going to sing three verses of it. <laughs>
doing our rehearsals, and I'm sure you will too. Mm -hmm. in the 11th month 
on the 11th day at the 11th hour at the 11th minute. They did this so that we'd never forget. Another reason the nations decided to have an armistice was because of the Spanish flu. It broke out in February of 1918. <clears throat> it was a highly contagious pandemic. People were dropping like flies. It raged for two years, eventually killing 50 million people worldwide. Sound familiar? Today we honor veterans that served. Some veterans came home with a Purple Heart, an award to prove that they were physically wounded. Some came home with a broken heart, an invisible wound that only God can heal. Some veterans relived battles every night of their lives, as real, as real as the battles they fought long ago. It is for these veterans that I'd like to pray for today. Almighty God, thank you for our veterans. Thank you for their sacrifice. Today we have a special request. Please heal all of our warriors that suffer from the consequences of war. Some can't sleep. Some become addicted trying to forget. Please help them to let go to stop their destructive thought patterns that have taken over their minds, stop them from taking their own lives. Please heal them, Father. Our loving Father, you have, you have forgiven us our sins so completely that you no longer remember them. It's like they never happened. Please use this healing for our veterans also, just like these things never happened. Please bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that is the only hope that will make these people whole again. And their poor families, they suffer as well. We ask this in Jesus' name, Father. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. stand. Our worship chorus starts off with Behold with Manner of Love.
Good morning. I'm not sure I need another sermon today. I'm a little bit emotional after all that. But it's, really, it's been a great morning, hasn't it? It's great to see everybody here today. Thank you all for coming. Please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Two weeks ago I preached on verses 1 to 4 of chapter 3. We talked about the problem of hypocrisy in the church. Remember that? And today we come to what is probably the best known proverb in the whole book. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. It's one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. I'm sure that's true for some of you as well. So is this anybody else's favorite passage? One of their favorite passages? It's also a very comforting passage for us to look at today, right after Election Day, isn't it? Because it reminds us that our trust is not in human institutions. Our trust is not in political leaders or political systems. Our trust is in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let me see a show of hands. How many of you have memorized these two verses? How many can quote them from memory? I'm not going to ask you to do that. What I'm going to ask you to do is to stand and read these two verses with me. So let's stand in honor of God's Word. Let's read our passage together. Ready? Trust, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not be in all your ways and ways. Do not be in all your ways and ways. Proverbs 3, 5, 5, 6. You may be seated. And may God bless the video as well. The Flying Rodleys are a group of trapeze artists who perform in the circus in Germany. Flying Rodleys. Okay. And Henry Nouwen writes about sitting down one day with Rodley, who was the leader of the group, and talking about what it's like to fly through the air. And Rodley said, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The audience thinks that I'm the star of the show, but the real star is Joe, my catcher. Joe has to be there for me with split-second timing and grab me out of the air as I come to him. And Henry said, how does it all work? And Rodley said, well, the secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, I simply stretch out my arms and hands and I wait for him to catch me. You do nothing, Henry said? Nothing, said Rodley. The worst thing the flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch Joe, he's supposed to catch me. If I grab Joe's wrist, I might break them, or if he, he might break mine, and that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly, and a catcher must catch, he said. And then Raleigh said this, he said, the flyer must trust, with outstretched arms, that his catcher will be there for him. Must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. It's a great picture of trust, isn't it? Fully committed, no going back. It's a great illustration of the kind of trust that Solomon talks about in our passage today. Because trusting in the Lord with all your heart is knowing that he'll be there for you, isn't it? Being a wholehearted disciple means to be fully committed, no going back. It means we put our complete trust in God. We stretch out our arms and our hands and we trust that he's going to be there to catch us. Amen? Amen. So here's my sermon outline for today. I've got three points today. We're going to do something a little unusual today, though we're going to start at the end of the passage. We're going to start at the end with the first thing we're going to talk about is the one promise that God makes in this passage. He promises to direct our paths. I want you to think about that for a second. The God of the universe promises to direct your path. The God of the universe is promising to do that for you. He promises divine guidance as we make decisions, as we choose which way to go and which direction we want to take. Would you like some of that this morning? Would you like some divine guidance today? Well, that's what God promises you. And God always keeps his promises, doesn't he? So it's a wonderful promise, but it's also a conditional promise. Okay, It's a conditional promise. God places three conditions on his promise to direct our paths. Number one, we have to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Number two, we have to not lean on our own understanding. And number three, we have to acknowledge him in all of our ways. We have to do all three of those things, right? Because if we don't do all three of them, then God's not obligated to keep his promise, is he? So we're going to talk about those three conditions and what we have to do in order to meet them. And after we look at the one promise and the three conditions, we're just going to talk about application. We're going to talk about what it looks like to live out the truth of these verses. We're going to talk about what it, what, how we can be a wholehearted disciple, fully committed, no going back. Right? So let's start with the one promise. In verse 6, God promises to direct our paths. First of all, how do we know that's a promise? How do we know that's a promise? And I say that because... Not every proverb is a promise, is it? Not every proverb is a promise. A proverb is a statement. It tells us something that's usually true. It's a picture of what life is usually like, but there, are, there can be exceptions, right? Think about the proverb, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That's a proverb. And what does it teach us? It tells us that eating right helps us to stay healthy. 
correct? Just because you have an apple every day doesn't mean you're never going to get sick, does it? It doesn't mean you're never going to have to go see the doctor. There's exceptions to that rule. So how do we know when a proverb is not just a proverb, but it's also a promise? How can we tell the difference? Well, we can tell by looking at the rest of Scripture. Because if a proverb repeats a promise that's recorded somewhere else in the Bible, then we can trust that it's a promise from God that he's going to keep, right? In the case of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that's what we've got here. We've got a proverb that's also a promise. And we know that because it repeats a promise that's made numerous times in the Bible. And this is the promise. That people who trust God experience his guidance in their lives. People who trust God experience his guidance in their lives. It's a promise from God. We see it throughout the Bible, don't we? <coughs> I start, I'll give you several examples. I'll start with Psalm 23. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. In other words, David trusted the Lord, right? And the Lord guided him like a shepherd guides his sheep. Psalm 73, 24 says, You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you'll take me to glory. Psalm 119, 105 says, the word, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, your word guides me, doesn't it? But it's not just in the Psalms that we see God promising to guide us, is it? You can find in other places that he does that. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, this is one of Melissa's favorite verses. The prophet Isaiah says to the people of Israel, Your ears will hear, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, This is the way you walk in it when you turn to the right or to the left. And of course, in John chapter 16, Jesus said, But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So we can take verse 6 as a promise, right? That God's going to direct our paths if we trust him. If we trust him. The next question is, what does the promise mean? What is God saying that he's going to do for us when he directs our path? Well, let's look at the Hebrew verb here. The Hebrew verb is yeshar. And it has two primary meanings. It can mean, number one, to direct or to lead someone or something on a particular path. Okay? We see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. This verb is used in that, verb, in that chapter. And it says that King Hezekiah directed the waters of Gihon to the west side of Jerusalem. In other words, he directed the flow of the water through aqueducts to make the water go where he wanted it to go. And that's one meaning of Yeshua. That's what God's saying. He can direct our path that way. Yeshar can also mean to make smooth or to make straight. Your translation may say that make your path straight. That's what it's talking about. This verse, this, this, this version is used in Isaiah 43, verse, excuse me, Isaiah 40, verse 3, where it says, The voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. You've all heard that, right? Three of the four gospel writers use that verse when they talk about the ministry of John the Baptist, don't they? Who came as the forerunner. He came to clear the way for the Messiah. Right? In that context, Yeshua means to remove any obstacles, to remove any impediments. It means to clear the way for the Messiah to be successful. And back to our question, what, is pro what, is the promise, what does the promise in verse 6 mean to us? Well, it could mean that God will lead us and guide us in the way that he wants us to go. He can direct our path like Hezekiah directed the water, right? That's one, that's one possibility. Or it could mean that he will make our way smooth and straight. He'll remove the obstacles. He'll remove the impediments so that we can be successful. Or I'm going to vote for both. It could mean both, right? How about yeah. both? I'll vote for both. But God's basically promising to guide your steps, to lead you in the right direction, okay? He promises to direct your path. And again, think about who's, who's, making that, who's making that promise to you. Who's making that promise? The only one who knows the future is making that promise to you. The one who declares the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things yet not yet done, Isaiah 46, verse 10. God already knows every situation you're ever going to face. He knows every pitfall, every detour, every delay on the road of life ahead of you. He knows everything. And so God is able to direct your paths, right? In fact, he's the only one who's qualified to do it, isn't he? And he wants to do it. God wants to direct your paths. He's waiting to do that for you right now. He's waiting to keep his promise. But as I said, it's a conditional promise, right? There's three conditions we have to meet according to these verses. And we're going to talk about those in just a moment. But I want to say one thing. When you boil it all down to this, God's guidance is like a GPS system on your cars. It's like a GPS 
GPS doesn't do you any good unless you do what? Unless you turn it on, unless you listen to it, unless you do what it says. Right? You've got to do all three of those things. You've got to turn it on, listen to it, and then do what it says. Well, God's guidance is the same way. If you want God to guide you, you have to ask Him, you have to listen to Him, and then you have to do what He says. If you don't do that, then you're going to get lost in a hurry, aren't you? You're going to get off track in a big hurry. I like this. David Hubbard said that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 are like the wedding vows between a husband and a wife. I never thought about that, but it's true. In other words, these verses spell out what's supposed to take place, what's supposed to be done in our relationship with Christ. This is what we're supposed to do. Whenever I do a wedding, I always ask the bride this question. I say, do you promise to love him, comfort him, honor and keep him, and forsaking all others, remain faithful and loyal to him for as long as you both shall live? And the bride says, I do. I do. Well, here God is asking us. He's asking the bride of Christ. You're the bride of Christ. He's asking you, will you trust in the Lord with all your heart? Will you not, will you not lean on your own understanding? Will you, in all your ways, will you acknowledge Him? And you're supposed to say, I will. I will. I could have said I do, but it's I will. Okay, so let's look at the three conditions that God puts on His promise here in verse 6. First, we have to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. We have to trust in Him with all of our heart. That's condition number one. Just like in marriage, we start with the commitment, don't we? The commitment to trust. The Hebrew word for trust here originally meant to lie face down. To lie face down. It's a, pic a picture of someone who's totally stretched out on their face before God. Their, their posture reflects the fact that they're totally dependent on God. They're totally yielded to God's will. They're on their face before Him. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who took that posture? You know, in the Bible, he was totally yielded to God's will. How about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Matthew 26, it says, Jesus went a little beyond and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Not as I will, but as you will. <coughs> That's the kind of trust God wants to see from us here in Proverbs chapter 3. Right? He wants us to trust him with everything he has with everything we have. He wants us to be like trapeze artists. Right? <laughs> Fully committed, no going back. Flying through the air and trusting him to catch us. That's what he wants to see. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because we always want to take things into our own hands, don't we? <clears throat> you know, when God's at the helm of the ship and he's steering us into a storm, we want to grab the rudder, don't we? We don't want to trust him. We've got to have it in our hands. That's what he's looking for. He wants us to trust him with all of our heart. He's looking for wholehearted disciples. Wholehearted disciples. Charles Stanley says that wholehearted trust means we can't pick and choose areas that we entrust to God while we try to keep other parts of our lives under our control. We don't get to pick and choose. Because partial trust is no trust at all, is it? Partial trust is no trust at all. If you're not trusting God with all, then you're not trusting Him at all. If you're not trusting Him with all, you're not trusting Him at all. Now that being said, none of us are perfect, are we? None of us can trust God perfectly. But God doesn't expect perfection from us, does He? What does He expect from us? He expects childlike trust. We should have a childlike confidence in our Father's wisdom and in His love, shouldn't we? Childlike confidence. bottom line here is that trust is an all or nothing proposition, all or nothing. We should trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. Trust Him with every decision, with every plan we make for the future. You're trusting Him for eternity, aren't you? Won't you trust Him for your life too? That's condition number one. Condition number two is the next line. Do not lean on your own understanding. If we go back to our wedding vow situation here, this is the renunciation part. This is the forsaking all others part. This is the leaving and cleaving part in Genesis chapter 2, right? We renounce, we leave behind our trust in everyone else, including ourselves, and we cleave to the Lord. We trust in Him for everything, with all of our hearts. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe, Proverbs 28, 26. That's what verse 5 is saying. We cannot trust ourselves, not even a little bit. You're a fool if you do that. We cannot trust in our intellect, in our abilities, our education, our experience, none of that. We can't trust in any of that. <coughs> our, 
wisdom is not sufficient. We need God's wisdom. We need to trust him completely in everything. We need to be, we need to be like Jesus' father, Joseph, don't we? When the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to take Mary as his wife, Joseph didn't lean on his own understanding, did he? Matthew 1, 24 says, He awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he, and he took Mary as his wife. He trusted and he obeyed the Lord. When the angel came in another dream and told him to take Mary and Jesus and go to Egypt, he didn't lean on his own understanding then, neither did he. Matthew 2, 14 says, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother while it was still night, and left for Egypt. He trusted and obeyed the Lord again. He's a good example for us, isn't he? Now let's talk about Abraham. He's more of a mixed bag in, in Genesis, isn't he? Sometimes he trusts the Lord, sometimes he leans on his own understanding. Kind of like me, kind of like you and me, hopefully. I, that's what I do. I don't know about you guys, that's what I do. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. The writer to the Hebrews says that by faith when he was called, Abraham obeyed, right? He trusted in the Lord. It says he went out not knowing where he was going. Once he got to Canaan, his own understanding told him what? That God couldn't provide for him in the famine, right? So what did he do? He went down to Egypt, he lied about Sarah being his sister, and he almost lost his wife, didn't he? Later on, he trusted God again. When God told him he was going to have as many descendants as there were stars in the heavens, right? Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham trusted, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. But in the very next chapter, what happened? His own understanding told him what? That God couldn't give him a child because he and Sarah were way too old to have kids, right? So what did he do? He slept with his wife. He slept with Sarah's maid. Her name was Hagar. And she gave birth to Ishmael, right? That brings up two points I want to make before we move on to the third condition. Two points here. Number one, trusting in the Lord is not a one-time decision, is it? It's not a one-time decision. Just because Abraham trusted God in Genesis 15, I didn't mean he was going to do it in chapter 16, did it? We're talking about being a wholehearted disciple, aren't we? And discipleship is not a one-time decision either. Discipleship is a lifetime commitment. Lifetime commitment. I've said this before. Being a disciple is not like being an organ donor. You don't just sign up for it and then there's nothing else for you to do until you die. Okay? That's not, that's not how it works. Being Christ's disciple means I follow him every single day. It means I surrender my will to his will every single day. It means that Jesus Christ reigns over my entire life. He's my king. I live in his kingdom, and I do what the king says. It's a lifetime commitment, isn't it? That's number one. Number two, when we don't trust in the Lord, and we rely on our own understanding, we're sinning, and there are consequences for that. Okay, it's a sin to do that, and there's consequences for that. You see that in Abraham's case, don't we? When Abraham and Sarah relied on their own understanding, what happened? Ishmael was born, wasn't he? And the consequences of that sin are what? What are the consequences of that sin? We're still having problems with that today, aren't we? Because of that. Just because of that one sin. Those are the first two conditions. The third condition is in verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him. And in our wedding vow scenario, this is the part where you remain faithful and loyal to him for as long as you both shall live. Right? This is the relationship part. This is the fellowship part. In all your ways, acknowledge him. All your ways means everything that you do. Every step you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. <laughs> Sorry. A little sting slipped out there for a second. But for Solomon, there's no division between the sacred and the secular, is there? There's no split between Sunday and the rest of the week. Every day is the Lord's day, right? We're called to acknowledge God every day in every area of our lives. Every day, every area of our lives. With our family and friends, with our finances, with our future, with everything. We're supposed to acknowledge Him with everything. And to acknowledge Him literally means to know Him. It literally says, in all your ways, know Him. So what does that mean? Well, I'll give you one example from James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, where it says... Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. For you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. 
But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. You know, that's one way to acknowledge God, isn't it? But Solomon's talking about more than that. To acknowledge God means that we walk with him everywhere we go. We walk with him everywhere we go. We don't take another step until after we ask him what to do. Basically, it means we make every decision with him in mind. We make every decision with God in mind, don't we? Those are the three conditions. So what's the application? I'm going to give it to you in three words. Ask God first. Ask God first. Ask God first before you make your plans. Ask God first before you plan your day, before you plan your week, before you plan your work, before you plan your vacation, before you plan your life. Ask God first. Ask Him to direct your path. And believe that he will, right? That's the important part. Believe that he will. Trust him that he's going to do that. We can have complete confidence in God, can't we? We can trust God because he's trustworthy. Right? Here's your Spurgeon quote for the week. Charles Spurgeon says, We can trust him whose power is inexhaustible, whose love is unbreakable, whose kindness is unchangeable, whose faithfulness is unfailing, whose wisdom is unfathomable, and whose goodness is impregnable. Amen? That's God. That's who our God is. I like to say this. I like to say that when we can't see God's hand, we can still trust his heart. <coughs> right? Even when we don't see God's hand working in our lives, we can still trust him. And we can do that, why? Because of the cross, right? We can do it because of the cross. We can do that because God sent his only son. We can do that because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. <coughs> You never have to doubt whether God loves you. All you have to do is look at the cross. Because Calvary is the place where God proved his love for us beyond any doubt, beyond all doubt. Right? And so if you're here today and you're not a Christian, the message for you this morning is this. It's to ask God first. Before you ask him for anything else, ask him first to forgive your sins. Ask him first to save your soul give you eternal life. God's waiting for you to do that. He's waiting for you to do that right now. In fact, you're holding up the party in heaven right now. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 15, Jesus says that there's joy in heaven. There's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Will you be that one sinner today? Will you be that one sinner this morning? Will you ask God to save you first? Will you ask Him, will you ask him first to save you today? And after you've done that, then you can join with the rest of us because we're going to ask God first about everything else, right? Aren't we? Amen? That's not how the world is these days, is it? That's not what the world does. Asking God first is countercultural. It's countercultural. Because in our society, nobody wants to be accountable to God, do they? Or, anybody, or to anybody else for that matter. We like to think we're self sufficient, self reliant. Self-made men and women, don't we? And if we ask God, we don't ask Him first. We ask Him last, right? It's a last resort. We do it when all else fails, we'll go and ask God, but not before that. Our society's favorite verse is, God helps those who help themselves. Except what? That's not in the Bible, is it? That comes from poor Richard's Almanac in 1757. Ben Franklin wrote that, not God. Our society's favorite song is My Way by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. You know, threw it all in there was doubt. I ate it up, I spit it out, I did it my way. Our society's favorite poem is Invictus by William Ernest Henley, which says, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Right? Who's the captain of your soul? You know. Whose understanding are you leaning on today? <clears throat> you only have two options. You can lean on your own understanding, or you can lean on the God who's greater than your understanding, right? Which one are you going to choose? Which choice are you going to make? Have you asked God to direct your path? Have you asked Him to do that? Do you involve God in your decision making? When's the last time you asked God first about your business or your job, about your marriage, about your family life? When's the last time you asked Him first? When's the last time you put your future in God's hand? 
When's the last time you surrendered your will to his will? <clears throat> Ask God first. It's a simple thing to do, isn't it? The question is, are you doing it? Are you leaning on God today? Let me ask you this. Do your Sundays belong to God? Do your Sundays belong to Him? What about the rest of the week? Can God do anything He wants with your life? In other words, who's steering the ship? What does God have in mind for you this holiday season? Have you thought about that? What about 2021? What does God want you to do next year? Is there a neighbor that He wants you to reach? Is there a hurting soul that he wants you to help? Is there a relationship in your life that he wants to heal and restore? <clears throat> Ask God first. Ask him to make your path straight. Ask him to clear the way for you, to remove any obstacles that might keep you from being successful. And then ask him to help you love your neighbor. Ask him to change someone's life in their eternity through you. And he will, he will, if you ask him first. We'll do that. My former pastor, Jim Denison, used to say this. Self-sufficiency is spiritual suicide. I have to say, we don't always choose to be self-sufficient, do we? We don't always choose to do that instead of trusting God. Sometimes it just happens. You know, we get busy, we get in a hurry, we have work to do, we have problems to solve. So we just don't make time for God, do we? But God's waiting to hear from you today. He's waiting to hear from you right now. He's waiting for you to ask Him first. He's ready to direct your path if you'll ask Him first. He's ready to make 2021 the best year of your life if you'll ask Him first. So ask Him first today, and then ask Him first tomorrow, and then do it again the next day and the next day, right? Keep doing it. Eugene Peterson wrote a Bible translation called The Message. You may have heard of it. And he used to tell this story about himself, about his problem with being self-sufficient. This was Eugene's problem with being self-sufficient. Eugene was working on his lawnmower one day, and his next-door neighbor was helping him. And Eugene had the mower tipped up on its side, and he was trying to remove the blade so he could sharpen it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there was a bolt that was stuck, and he couldn't get the nut. He couldn't budge the nut with the biggest wrench. He couldn't get the nut off. So he put a four-foot length of pipe over the wrench handle to get more leverage. And when that didn't work, he picked up a rock and he started banging on the end of the pipe with a rock. And then his neighbor pointed out, the threads went the other way. <laughs> right? When he reversed the effort, the nut just came right off. Everything was perfect. He'd been trying to do it all himself instead of asking his neighbor first. Right? So are you trying to force your life in the wrong direction? Stop trying to be self-sufficient. Ask God first. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. That's the promise of God, amen? Amen. Okay, we out of time. Hollis, I'm going to ask Hollis to come and lead us in a closing prayer, and then Rich and Kim are going to lead us in our closing hymn. Grace is greater than all of our sin. trust in you with all of our heart to not lean on our own understanding but in all of our ways in our thinking our doing our being our spending our coming our going 
to acknowledge you, to acknowledge that you are God, to acknowledge that you know all all powerful, ever present, unending, never changing, infinite, holy, eternal God, all powerful. And know, and know in the deepest part of our hearts, O oh Lord, help us to know that when we ask you first, you will make straight our paths. You will direct our paths. Lord, we don't have to understand them. Help us not to even try to impose our level of understanding on what you have said. You have said it, and that's enough. It's not up to us to acknowledge it, but just to acknowledge you and know that you are God and know that it is well, it is well with our soul when we trust in the Lord with all our heart. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>